Before we get into this, I just wanted to say something more about Clever. And I, I suspect this will be provocative to some of you. But I've, I haven't heard Rob say it quite like that before, but it reminded me of being back at the BBC. And uh, when I was the HR director of the BBC, the BBC, unsurprisingly, is full of lots of clever people, most of whom, by the way, really hate the BBC. And they, in particular, hate the suits and the management of the BBC. Now, this is the provocative thought. Some of my HR colleagues wished that they didn't exist. Well, why don't you get rid of these clever people, Gareth? They, they really, you know, they're, they're not loyal. They don't support the organization. They're a pain. They break HR rule number 37A frequently. And this is my view. They're the ones who make the great programs. They make Blue Planet. They, they make great comedy. They, they do the Radio 4 news program in the morning. And they're really really difficult. And without them, you'd never make great radio or TV or online. So, and, I, and I sometimes think, when I'm being particularly gloomy about HR, is that what HR people want to do is wrap a process around cleverness so that we can control it better. And by the way, in the process of controlling it, you'll kill it. When I was in the music business, um, we owned... Uh, Def Jam Records, which became uh, the biggest rap label in America. And we got some reports from the management information system which said Def Jam Records is out of control. So I went, <coughs> my boss sent me to uh, New York to see Def Jam, and sure enough, it was out of control. They were all driving around in gold limousines, they were flying first class when they could have taken a taxi. I mean, it was unbelievable. I went back to London and I said, Def Jam's out of control, and this is my view, you should leave it alone. It could be the next Tamla Motam. Anyway, my boss ignored my advice and he sent in a Dutch accountant who in six months nearly killed the label. In its best year, by the way, Def Jam took 6% of the American music market. That's a big, that's a big number, by the way. So I, I sometimes think that in HR, we so much want to control and wrap processes around stuff without fully understanding the drive towards the clever economy. Anyway, that, that's, I'm being sort of deliberately provocative here, and maybe I'm too much the other way, and I thrive on chaos. And for the MBTI people in the room, you know, I'm, I'm P off the scale. You know, I'm, um, so, OK, but, but it's worth thinking about, I think. Um, in the last 18 months or so, I've been working with, um, with my friend and colleague, John Harding, here at Barclays. And um, John will say much more about this later. It's a really interesting story, I think. But some of my academic colleagues were saying to me, are you doing anything interesting, Gareth, at the moment? I'd say, yeah, I'm working with Barclays. I said, we're, we're, we're trying to reinvent Barclays. I said, it sounds like a really big project. I said, oh, it's much bigger than that. Because you can't reinvent Barclays without reinventing banking. And you can't reinvent banking without reinventing capitalism. So it's a big project. <laughs> anyway, we were making some progress. John will say much more about this later. And then, of course, as is the way with the capitalist enterprise, a new chairman arrived, and the new chairman didn't like the chief executive, and then the chief executive is the former chief executive, and then a new chief executive arrives, and start all over again. But we are in a moment where we are reinventing capitalism. I mean, Rob mentioned the Enron scandal. Prior to the Enron scandal, we used to believe that the capitalist enterprise was responsible to its shareholders. Well, that ideology is holed beneath the waterline, isn't it? By the way, that's not a new thought. That was written by two American economists in the 1930s called Berlin Means in the Managerial Revolution, who argued that the modern business enterprise was responsible only to itself. That's why we have a crisis of governance. So this is a big moment. Now, that, that this is all a bit gloomy. The, the optimistic thought, by the way, is that capitalism has a very good track record at reinventing itself. In fact, I think our view is that it's time to start deconstructing the notion of capitalism. Has anyone here worked in Singapore? 
I can't see at the back. Does anyone work in Singapore? Yeah, no? Yes? Yes. Would you describe it as a capitalist economy? No, well, it's sort of, it looks capitalist, doesn't it? And until you say to somebody, can you tell me who owns your corporation? And you'll find the hand of the state everywhere. And by the way, the fastest growing capitalist economy in the world is controlled by the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party. And by the way, Scandinavian capitalism, which has come through the crisis in pretty good shape, is not really very much like North American and Anglo-Saxon capitalism. So capitalism's more than one thing, almost certainly. But this is the context in which we wrote Why Should England Work Here? And we asked lots of people in different ways. So just to be very precise on methodology, we collected questionnaire data, we ran workshops, we interviewed people, we did direct observation. Rob and I, as Adam mentioned, are both compulsive note takers. So we, we learned to be sociologists in the days where you took your notepad with you everywhere. In fact, I shall write notes about you later. <laughs> I'm serious, I will. Uh, you might appear in a book in a few years' time. Who knows? Um, so we've got data from lots of different sources. Um, and we asked people to describe the organization of their dreams. And dreams turns out to be a mnemonic. D, difference beyond diversity. I can be myself. By the way, Here's a thought for you. Whether you like it or not, you will spend the bulk of your adult waking life at work. It better be a place where you can be yourself. If it isn't, you will lose yourself. And then you're in deep trouble. It's what we call in Welsh, cachy poeth. If I explain that poith means hot, you can work out the other word for yourself. <laughs> Surely you can, yeah. Ah, radical honesty. Tell me the truth before someone else does. Our view in a world of WikiLeaks, Freedom of Information Acts, Twitter, whistleblowers, corporate secrets are over. Tell the truth before someone else does. E, add value to me, don't exploit me. Add to my human capital. A, authenticity, I know what we stand for. Say what you mean and mean what you say. M, I want a meaningful job in an organization which itself has meaning. And finally, there are no stupid rules. I want to work in an organization where there are simple, agreed rules. Now, as you look through this list, I'm going to deal with the first three, and then Rob will, will deal with the others. You, you might think, well, think of the opposite. I, I want to be in an organization where I can't be myself. I want to be systematically lied to. I want to be exploited. I want the organization to not mean what it says. My work is meaningless, and my organization has no purpose, and I love to drown in a fog of bureaucracy. Well, if you think of all the opposites, why could we find no organizations that did all of this? We found some making some heroic efforts, by the way. We're going to hear a little later from Novo Nordisk, which I suppose if I had to pick one organization, well, there's one or two, I think, that I, I would like to have worked for in, when we did the research. Novo Nordisk would certainly be one of them. But Believe me, it's not wonderful at all of them. Definitely not. And Chrissia will tell us a little bit about how she's going to fix that <laughs> shortly. Um, so why is it so difficult? Now, there's, there's probably two big reasons. And they're big sociological reasons, really. One, the modern form of capitalism. And two, as predicted by Max Weber, the inexorable rise of bureaucracy. Mankind will be trapped in an iron cage of his own making from which he cannot escape. He was a cheerful fellow, Max Weber. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote the script for The Office, actually. Yeah, yeah. So let me have a look at all of these in a bit more detail. Difference, you can be yourself here. 
Um, just some slightly provocative uh, photographs here. These three photographs at the top, they come from an organization called uh, Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy, perhaps the most successful luxury branded goods company in the world. Uh, Rob and I have both worked with them for some time, Rob most intensively in, in recent years. Um, what they're really good at is difference. It's sort of unexpected, this. If you walked into a room full of LVMH executives, you would, of course, find these incredibly glamorous dress designers and slightly over the top, and you'd find the noses from the perfume business, and you'd find the guy who runs Chateau Ikem, you know, the nearest thing to the nectar of the gods. But you would also find the sharpest lawyers, the toughest finance people, who are asking really hard monitor evaluator type questions of the creatives. And the chief executive, Mr. Arnaud, is really good at encouraging that conflict. So there's constantly this friction in the room between these kind of slightly wacky creatives and these absolutely hard-nosed commercial people. And it makes it, by the way, a great company. And another, this is a small example, really, this is a company that we talk about in the book, Waitrose. Now, supermarkets are interesting. Do we have anyone here from, from retail, from big retailers? No? See, you, you could think about supermarkets a bit like bank branches as identical units of production. You know, there ought to be a plan, shouldn't there, at head office, which says, this is what the supermarket will look like. This is how wide the aisles will be, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's not Waitrose's view. Waitrose's view is that um, each store should have its own character. So in the book, we tell the story of a store where they employ a young man who's got Down syndrome, um, and he collects the trolleys, which, of course, gives his life real meaning. And every morning when he comes in, he kisses the store manager. Now, I hate to say this, but somewhere in the HR department, someone has sent out an email saying... You are not allowed to kiss the store manager until after 9 o'clock at the Christmas party. <laughs> and then only on the cheek. <laughs> well, that's not how Waitrose see it. Uh, I had a lovely experience recently. I was at a swanky CIPD do. I shan't say too much detail here, but I was on a table with uh, some pretty senior HR people, and the facilitator, facilitator on the table turned to each of the, they, they were mainly men, turned to each of the men and said, I want you to imagine you've got 20 minutes with the chief executive. What are the three questions you will ask? And all the guys went, stock options, long-term incentive plans, you know, all the kind of sexy comp and Ben stuff. And then eventually he worked around to the woman in the room who was the HR director for John Lewis. And um, he said, and, and what do you think? She said, I'd ask, how do we make people happier? I thought it was a magic moment, actually. It was absolutely divine. How do we make people happier? Uh, and you can see, you know, and this is from an ad, but, you know, it's about happiness. Um, so difference beyond diversity, a another organization. What, why does difference matter? Here's a one-liner. Creativity increases with diversity and declines with sameness. So ask yourself the question, does your organization need to be creative and innovative? Now, Rob, Rob and I started a little business a long time ago called Creative Management Associates, in which we thought we'd be focused on science-based businesses and media businesses. Well, guess what? Everyone needs to be creative. Water companies, banks, retailers, consulting companies. Everyone needs to be creative. So creativity increases with diversity and declines with sameness. Again, when I'm slightly gloomy about HR, I think we're in the business of coding sameness. With prescriptive competence models, which intimately prescribe behaviors. Well, you'll kill creativity. Uh, another organization that comes out we both really liked in the organization is Ove Arab, the consulting engineers, responsible for some of the most creative and dynamic buildings in the world. Um, we want there to be parts that don't quite fit. We don't want there to be only four objectives. It means you'll never get the fifth. 
How many of us in this room have written KPIs? Well, all of us, right? Are they ever complete? Never, are they? There's always something you can't quite capture, and it's usually the bit that's going to make the big difference, isn't it? And, and this is not an argument about not writing KPIs. It's fine. But let's realize their limitations. Um, it's not just. See, from an HR perspective, diversity really matters, doesn't it? Are we, I'm sure we've all been in there. <clears throat> you know, are we employing enough women? Are they getting to the top? Are we, do, we, do we represent the ethnic makeup of our customer base? All of those things are really important. I would count as one of my minor successes at the BBC, gender. So when I left the BBC, BBC One was run by a woman, BBC Two was run by a woman, the head of radio was a woman, the head of strategy was a woman, and the deputy finance director was a woman. So it was the most gender diverse top team in the FTSE 100. OK? But if you just treat diversity as ticking boxes, and then you force people to be all the same once they get there, you're not really getting it. This is difference beyond diversity. This is encouraging people to be themselves. And from this, you get commit, commitment and creativity. And your task is to amplify, amplify difference rather than to minimize it. Ah, radical honesty. You know what's really going on. Um, tell the truth before someone else does. Uh, BP is a great company, by the way, great British company. Uh, it completely lost control of the social media agenda after the Gulf oil spill. Now, I, I don't know how long it will take BP to repair its reputational capital. I hope it does. But my prediction is it will take quite a long time. Um, some of us have stopped drinking in Starbucks until they start paying their taxes. Many of us in this room have just paid a big tax bill, haven't we? January the 31st. I think I paid more than Google. <laughs> well, I certainly paid more as a percentage than Google. That's an cer absolute certainty. An absolute certainty. Um, Ray, what have we learned about reputational capital in the last 10 years? It's more important than we thought, and it's much more fragile. It's much more fragile. We'll hear later from Novo Nordisk. Novo Nordisk is the world's largest supplier of insulin. So millions, hundreds of millions of people across the world depend on the efficacy and safety of Novo Nordisk's drugs in order to live. Think how fragile that is. Think how important quality is. Think how important safety is if you're a diabetic. Um, I'm sure many of us travel a lot. Um, there's some really interesting research about what annoys people you know, when they get to the airport or, or, um, or the train station and, and their, their flight's cancelled. So you, know, you get to the airport, and you're, the airport's pretty stressful anyway. You've got through security, flight cancelled or flight delayed. Do you know what really annoys travellers? They don't know why. They don't know why. See, if it says your flight's delayed because one of the engines isn't working, you go, oh, great. I'm really glad they delayed the flight. I didn't want, or, you know, they delayed the flight because none of the lavatories are working. Oh, great. I'm really pleased about that. If you don't know, you just get really annoyed. Now, you see, when Machiavelli wrote The Prince, he may have been right. He may have been right. In the modern world, you get power by sharing information, not by hoarding it. Again. Slightly jaundiced view about HR directors. I know quite a lot of old HR directors like me whose power base is this. I know where the bodies are buried. I am the keeper of the corporate secrets. They're like an extra from The Godfather. <laughs> well, I think that world's over, frankly. That world's gone. Um, two quick examples. Uh, Heineken, this appeared on YouTube. It looks like a dog, it's a dog fight, and it looks like it's happening in a venue sponsored by Heineken. And Heineken very, very quickly flooded the social media to say Heineken does not support dog fighting. There's a, also 
a nice example from Novo Nordisk. Novo Nordisk decided, did a strategic review, decided to close down an R&D facility in the United States. The chief executive, Lars Rabian Sorensen, who's just won the prize, by the way, for the best CEO in the world, as voted by Harvard Business Review subscribers. That's remarkable, isn't it, for a European company, uh, in a way, a fundamentally Danish company. Uh, anyway, Lars Rabian Sorensen flew to the United States, called a town hall meeting, explained the reasons for the closure of the R&D facility, set out the steps that Novo Nordisk would take to relocate people and to help them find other jobs. And do you know what happened? People stood up and applauded. I can think of some banks where people have read in the Financial Times that they've lost their jobs. It's not very good, is it? That's not very good, is it? It's not a very good way to treat your people. Um, extra value, and then I'll hand over to Rob. Rob said some of this already. Uh, we're familiar with this in elite companies. Um, but this is an example in the book. Um, it's low cog. This is Gene Tomlin, who is the HR director of the London Organizing Committee of the Olympic Games. If any of you ever need a really inspiring HR speaker, by the way, who will talk about what does strategic HR really mean, she's, she's the bee's knees. She's absolutely brilliant. Um, LOCOG recruited the largest number of peacetime volunteers. By the way, many of the volunteers had never worked before. Think about that from an HR point of view. It's incredible, isn't it? I'll probably start to cry as I tell this story, but I am Welsh, and we cry watching paint dry, so this is no, <laughs> no, no great test. But uh, uh, I, I was, Rob and I were both like, Rob wasn't there, but we were lucky enough to be invited to the rehearsal for the opening ceremony. Anyway, I said to my wife, do you fancy going? And she said, no. I said, oh, great, fine. So I went with my, with my assistant, Pamela, and I thought, well, it'll be a night out. You know, we'll have a glass of wine. It'll be a bit of a laugh. So we arrived. We had a glass of wine on the way there. We got to Stratford. And as we walked out of Stratford tube station, we, I am going to start to cry. We are greeted by the volunteers. So within 100 yards, the whole of London is there. London in all its wonderful cultural diversity. And I said to Pamela, this will be extraordinary. And of course, the volunteers made the games. They made the, for those of you who are privileged enough to attend the Olympics, the volunteers made the games. And Rob and I wrote a little blog about this on hbr.org saying, what happened is the volunteers infected the regular employees. So, you know, people on the tube, the police, were all brilliant, fantastic. And it transformed the games. Um, and McDonald's. So McDonald's gets a bad press, particularly in the United States, for paying not very high wages. But McDonald's recruits mainly young, unskilled people who have been failed by the education system. And it teaches them basic literacy and numeracy. And in 18 months' time, if they work hard and they're really good and they're focused, they could be a shift leader for McDonald's. That's a remarkable process of adding value. So our view is lots of organizations can be in the business of adding value. Rob, can I hand over to you one more slide? Oh, yeah. It's not just with employees. Um, EY, Rob will say a bit more about this. Talk about purpose beyond just employee, employee uh, uh, partner earnings. Um, well, here's another example. Um, Ducati make sort of um, great motorbikes. What do you think the people who buy Ducati motorbikes do at the weekend with their bikes? What do you think? They ride them? Yeah, OK, yeah, good. We've got some clever people in here. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, what else do they do with them? Well, they, they meet with other Ducati people, they take the engines apart, and then they put the engines back together again. And then on Sunday, they ride them. Well, what, you know what Ducati have discovered? That the people who play around with the engines know more about the engines than they do. So they've now co-opted about 150 Ducati nuts, obsessive, Ducati obsessives, to help them think about how you design an engine. Uh, the first piece of consulting I ever did was with Bass, when Bass was still a brewer. 
And if you were on the board of Bass, it was in your job description that you had to visit a pub every day. <laughs> I have to say, I loved it. <laughs> the, the chairman was then a man called Sir Charles Darby, who was ex-military, and he used to say, you're the only bloody consultant we've had who likes the product. <laughs> That's good. It's good advice. You didn't have to go to a bass pub. You could go to any pub. But you had to watch people consume the product. You had to kind of share in that. So it's about reaching out beyond that. Uh, Rob, authenticity. Yep. Okay. Uh, don't worry. We're almost there. So um, AM and S. Well, authenticity is where we started. Uh, if you remember that far back an hour or so ago. And um, um, it's a big word with um, many meanings. And of course, in many organizations, it's something to do with where you come from and where you're headed. And in many organizations, we try and encapsulate it, don't we, in um, mission statements of one kind or another. And I thought I'd um, share with you briefly some examples of mission statements. This is fairly small writing, but there's monitors around the room. Can you actually read these words? Are they visible? Yeah, I'll just give you a moment to digest this first one. And then another one. Um, it may take a while to digest these, actually. <laughs> but uh, for those of you that have already got indigestion, I'll show you something easier to consume. That's a bit simpler, isn't it? And then the fourth and final one is um, perhaps the simplest of all, and um, maybe the one you like best of all. Um, so now I'll reveal uh, where these come from. Uh, the first two that you're probably still digesting come from the Dilbert mission statement <laughs> generator, um, where you simply take parts of sentences and put them together in any kind of random order. And this is the kind of gibberish that you come up with. And some of you, I could see, were taking notes, thinking, this is a good one, yeah. Um, <laughs> We can use this. Uh, so they're remarkably close, aren't they, to some of the gibberish that uh, companies really do come up with. Um, the third one down might be one that you um, prefer, and that comes from a real um, American um, social organization, uh, the United Way. And the last one might be the most appealing of all to many of you, and that one comes from Enron, um, <clears throat> which is why we should look at mission statements with... Um, you know, a, a, a real sort of critical eye. Um, so clearly, you can't judge authenticity from these kinds of sources, I don't think. Um, when we, in, in, in the book, when we tried to think about this and talk about it, um, again, listening carefully to people that spoke to us, these things seem to come through as quite important when people focus precisely on this thing of authenticity. Uh, one theme has something to do with roots. Where do you come from? Uh, if you look up the Oxford English Dictionary definition of authenticity, I'll save you the task. Uh, this is what it says, of undisputed origins. That's the Oxford English Dictionary definition of authenticity, of undisputed origins. So I think this thing about roots, and because we've owned up to being sociologists, of course, we're endlessly interested in individual roots. Um, uh, but actually, it's also in interesting, isn't it, to think about organizational roots and where organizations come from. And I think this is at least a clue in terms of understanding authenticity. I did a lot of work over recent years with uh, New York Life Insurance, um, an old mutual with deep, deep, deep roots. And very skillful, I think, at, at acknowledging them and using them and encouraging its executives to, I quote, honor the legacy. That's one of the expectations of a New York Life Insurance uh, executive. And of course, it's kind of um, maybe sort of understandable when you look at these venerable old institutions. But in the book, we also talk a bit about Apple. And um, this is our way of saying that you don't need to be old to have roots. Uh, and Apple, uh, we think anyway, is rather <laughs> skillful at uh, using its rather recent roots in defining who it is. Um, and still uses those roots rather successfully. So a rooted sense of identity is one. Um, living what you preach, you know, living the values is clearly another. Um, we use several examples in the book. One of them is BMW. Thank God we chose BMW um, rather than another car company ending with W. But, um, so we were lucky. But the BMW engineer in the morning knows why he's going to work. Uh, the value to build the ultimate driving machine. So the values are absolutely lived. And sometimes it's kind of lived in relationships uh, a long time ago, Gareth and I used to do some work 
one of the first big clients we ever worked with at London Business School, Heineken, a uh, program led by John Hunt, who we'll come back to right at the end of the day. But um, Heineken, uh, I remember a marketing guy saying to me years back, uh, you realize, Rob, what we sell, it's not beer. We sell emotional sociability. Um, and you won't be surprised to know that the culture of Heineken uh, is characterized by emotionally sociable mechanisms consuming large quantities of Heineken. Um, and uh, it's been a very enjoyable place to work. Leaders modeled the values. This is a slightly, so, so three ways of spotting authenticity or ways in which uh, people we were speaking to understood authenticity. And this sounds slightly circular, doesn't it? But authentic organizations seem to have authentic leaders. Alex Ferguson's doing the kind of leadership round now, isn't he? And teaching at most of the business schools, including ours, I think, recently. But. Um, uh, I think some of what he says is kind of impressive, clearly has an impressive track record. And the thing that echoes in my ears is this comment he made about uh, building a club, not a team. And those of you that do follow soccer or football will know that actually he built about seven or eight teams. That was his achievement. He was able to do it because he built a club. The leaders modeled the values. It pains, you know, Gareth's a Spurs supporter. I'm a West Ham supporter. So it's, um, gives, and we've just lost credibility with half the people in the room. But... Um, <laughs> if we hadn't lost it already, but it pains us to uh, acknowledge Ferguson. But um, I think he is someone who kind of, insofar as Manchester United is a wonderful football club, uh, he embodied it. Um, and here's another rather provocative figure. Um, and that's our way of saying, I'm sure you recognize the man that runs Ryanair. And he evokes strong reactions, doesn't he? Love him or hate him, and so does the culture. And that's our way of saying, if you haven't spotted it already, these authentic organizations, as it were, that we're mentioning throughout our little list here, they're not necessarily easy or nice places to work. Um, they can be edgy places to work. And authenticity doesn't always equate to good, you know, the place that you'll actually necessarily like all the time. They can be edgy. Um, okay, so uh, M is for meaning. Uh, we want to do a meaningful job in a, with an organization that has a meaningful purpose. Um, go to libraries, you'll see sort of endless books on jobs and meaning, and engagement literature is very closely linked to all of this. Uh, I read something recently, Alan de Botton's book on work, and he kind of had this very simple definition of what um, uh, job meaning is all about. It's about increasing pleasure and reducing pain, hence the vet gets the pleasure of bo both reducing the pain and increasing the pleasure and seeing the end product of what they do. And of course, many of us are not lucky enough to be in jobs where we see the end outcome in terms of increasing pleasure or reducing pain. Um, and that's the problem, you know, that we work in large complex organizations where there are divisions of labor, time scale lags, et cetera, et cetera, complexity, which disconnects what we do from end outcomes. Um, one of the things I think when you think about this issue of meaning is not to impute where you get meaning from to where others get meaning. Apparently, the world's most, most dissatisfying job uh, is supposedly uh, fish gutting, most unpopular job. We know people that gut fish and love it. Uh, we certainly know people that um, we like going to uh, pubs. And uh, by the way, going to pubs and drinking beer is Gareth's core competence, if you <laughs> hadn't spotted this. But um, so we found ourselves in pubs taking notes and occasionally having a drink uh, on a regular kind of basis. And we like observing you know, the barman that pour, likes pouring the perfect pint and gets meaning from it. And so that's our way of saying you'll be surprised. There, there's, people can eke out meaning from apparently the most meaningless context, but um, you can get meaning from. So it's not so much, I think, for most of us, the job itself. It's to do with how the job connects to other jobs. Um, I'm referring here briefly to the Komatsu Caterpillar Legendary Harvard Business School case study, which is all about the ways in which that organization, Komatsu, managed to connect jobs on the ground to a long-term mission in terms of surrounding Caterpillar, uh, linking it to a wider community and linking it to a cause. We've already spoken about, um, so three Cs, uh, community, com connections, community, and cause. So I think it's where, how the jobs are embedded in a work community, how they're connected to other jobs, and how they're connected to an end cause. That's where the real challenges are co come, I think, in terms of creating meaning in organizations. Uh, this is the boss of uh, EY, the managing partner of EY in uh, UK and Ireland, and when he took Steve Varley, and uh, when he took on the job a few years back, he went to his first partners meeting, announced record profits, and said in public, is that all there is? 
Is it just about record surplus? Um, many of you in the room, I'm sure, will recognize that the most profitable organizations are not the most profit-oriented. Uh, they're the ones that derive meaning from a long-term noble cause, as it were, that will itself generate those profits in the long run. So we're finally at uh, S for the simple rules. Gareth uh, spoke evocatively about the benefits of D, where we started difference. Uh, allowing people to come to work and be themselves does not translate into anarchy. Uh, we all actually want to work somewhere where there are some simple rules that we all agree to. Uh, and without rules, without those kind of simple rules, ironically, there's no freedom. At the end of today's session, we could allow you all to go home and drive on whichever side of the road you'd like to drive. Uh, there's freedom, and half of you will be dead by the end of the day. So we all know, don't we, that what we need is organisations with simple, agreed rules. And the disaster is that many of us are working in organisations with rules which are complex and imposed not simple and agreed. So there's a challenge, isn't there, clearly. Um, one challenge, of course, is that we kind of have rules that, uh, this is a, an old sociologist, Alvin Goudner, from the 1950s. Uh, he talked about mock rules, and a uh, short definition of the mock rules is the ones that are there, but we don't believe in them. We don't practice them. We kind of collusively agree collectively to ignore them. So here he is, but it wasn't just him, was it? Um, and really, um, as a sports fan, this, you know, the, the mock rules for me is almost the definition of the inauthentic organisation. You know, rules that are there and we all agree to ignore. Um, and they're kind of all around us, I think. Rule creep, rule process creep and so on, that's something else. Hewlett Packard was a once great company and has fell upon more troubled times. But um, even Hewlett Packard kind of drowned in a way in... Yeah, and some of you are nodding your heads furiously here. Maybe you, you were there, but, um, you know, drowned in a sort of complex bureaucratic set of processes. And uh, Apple is a wonderful company in many, many ways, and it makes wonderful products. Um, the last time I visited an Apple store, I felt like I was in an airport, attempting to get my phone mended, visiting the irritatingly named Genius Bar. I, I it didn't feel like a genius, and it didn't feel like geniuses were serving me either. I felt like I was being processed as a number in an airport. Badly. So, Max Weber was right about bureaucracies. You know, even the sexy brands can get killed by them. Um, and uh, London Business School, can I share this story confidentially with you? Uh, so Gareth and I asked Andrew Lickerman, our dean, when we were developing these ideas, we went through the model and said, OK, Andrew, how's London Business School doing? And the one he felt where there was the biggest challenge was simple rules. I find that really interesting. How many people work for London Business School? Five or six hundred, maybe? It's about five or six hundred. There's a hundred, hundred odd faculty, five or six hundred total. And um, Andrew felt the biggest challenge was simple rules. So by comparison to the organisations that most of you are working in, we're, we're sort of small scale and, you know, based in one place, basically, and we're, pff, simple rules is the challenge. Uh, when I joined London Business School, I hate to tell you, so long ago, 30 years ago, I think, uh, when I joined London Business School, I think the faculty handbook was about 30 pages long. Would you like to guess how long it is now? The last time I looked, I think it was about 330 pages. See, professors love complicating things. Um, it's a kind of demonstration of cleverness to go back to, well, not really cleverness, but... Um, OK, so rule process, rule creep, it uh, comes to all of us. And uh, here's a kind of interesting one, I think. Entrepreneurial growing businesses and the people that run them regularly, I think, confuse the need to systematise with the devil called bureaucracy. The reality is that, la that growing businesses need systems. Growing businesses need systems. And systems are good, you know. Uh, if you would like me to translate, systems are places where you might know what the rules are for. And bureaucracies are places, the way we think about them in a popular sense, places where you don't know what the rules are for. 
So simple agreed rules. Um, without kind of letting the cat out of the bag too early today, uh, a lot of organisations were really struggling with this one of the six dimensions that we were talking about. As Gareth said, there's no organisation brilliant on all dimensions, but this one seemed to be a big challenge for many. Now, we are near the end, and um, as a kind of possible link into the three case studies that we're going to come to after our little coffee break, um, here's a first, we have more to say on this later, but here's a first couple of thoughts in terms of building the Dreams organisation. First thing is, you know, are you creating from a blank sheet of paper as an entrepreneurial startup or whatever? Well, clearly that offers you more opportunities. There's an organisation we mention in the book, you won't be able to see what it says on their T-shirts, but it, it says super, Supercell. Have any of you heard of Supercell? They make, um, yes, some of you are nodding, Clash of Clans, which is, I think, the world's kind of hottest uh, mobile phone game. They're based in Finland. They're based in Helsinki. Uh, when this picture was taken, that was the total number of employees. Uh, I think they've now got 170 people working for them. They've been around for about five years, and their revenues are 2 billion euros. Um, and if you go on to the website and take a look at what they want as an organisation, it is more or less word for word, D-R-E-A-M-S. And if you're a 170-person business, mainly located in one place in Helsinki, uh, with some gifted, talented people and a clear idea of what you want to do, oh, and you've got 2 billion euros coming in every year, um, you can build the dreams organisation. And that's my way of saying, maybe startup businesses have got a kind of opportunity uh, and maybe, and that's kind of embedded in what, much of what we've been talking about in terms of complex large-scale organisations and the pressures of capitalist markets and bureaucratic organisations, maybe when you grow, things get tougher. So then you've got to confront questions about how you sustain the spirit of the startup. Or maybe if you don't sustain the spirit of the startup organisation, how you go back and recapture it. And, um, well, two out of the uh, three... Uh, case organisations that are going to speak, A.T. Carney and Barclays, will at least, I think, shed light a little, and maybe on many other things too, um, on how you get into this process of recapturing some of the early magic. So with those last words, uh, at least last for the minute, um, my suggestion is, and we're three or four minutes ahead of schedule, which is unbelievably a record <laughs> for Gareth and I, um, uh, what we'd going to do now, I think, is take a break. I've forgotten for how long. Uh, Adam's going to yes. do it. Yes, I'll just... I'll just uh, I'm a professor. Worry. I don't know. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, thank you.